Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I've got a cool unboxing episode for you guys tonight. So, three guitars, one accessory, maybe some pretty cool stories. Let's go ahead and start with this one. This is a purchase through my new Guitar Day program. If you're not familiar, it's on my website. It's called NGD. You can just Google it. You'll find the page. It's a process where viewers of the show, they like to see their guitar before they get it, you know, just get unboxed on the show. Sometimes it's a full review and demo. Other times, if I've already done the model or I'm just not that interested in doing a full review, we just unbox it here. And this works well for people who want to see it unboxed on the show so they can have a memorabilia of Drogleek's guitar history. And the other time this comes in real handy is if somebody is international and the dealer will not ship internationally. Now that falls under my international forwarding service, so that's a little bit different. There's a small upcharge because, you know, shipping internationally, that's a lot of paperwork and you got to pack the guitars a little bit differently. But I believe this one's going to Canada. But let's go ahead and uh, take a quick look at this. Oh, wow. Holy Toledo. It's the bald man guitar. <laughs> you guys remember this episode? I called this the bald man's dream guitar because it reminded me of a bearded guy that had no hair up top. And I said that because they've got this black border around here. Like now on that guitar, I thought it was just how it wasn't actually supposed to be. Like somebody just messed up the finish. But no, it's, it's a real finish out there. And you can find it at Guitar Center right here. Oh my goodness, in person. I thought this was just a plain top studio. This finish just pops so much. It's so vibrant and we've got quite a bit of flame figuring. I mean, when you buy from Guitar Center, you don't actually get to see the guitar that you've ordered. So I think this is a, an extraordinary ordinary example, as I like to call them where you just happen to win the wood grain lottery. And some guys will specifically buy through me because they think I have a higher chance at getting a nice guitar. I don't think so. <laughs> it's just random chance, but hey, it's fun to get new content for the show. So let's see here, what year is this? It's a 2021? Wow, really? So this is a modern day Les Paul studio. I don't think I've actually had one of these before. I kind of regret not doing the full review and demo on this. Like the back has this kind of cool color separation going on. This piece of mahogany was slightly lighter in color, whereas this one's darker. It's kind of hard to show you guys what I mean, but I think you can kind of see it right here when I get it in the light just right. I like quirky stuff like that on guitars. And this finish, it looks better in person. I will say that. <laughs> It was, it was a little bit strange when I first saw that whole fade thing, because it's like a reverse fade. Generally, fades look like this, but this one's the, the opposite of that. So it's kind of cool in person. Now, I am seeing a few small QC issues on this one. Like right here, the lacquer has chipped off the side of the fretboard. It's so hard to tell if that's actually the wood that's chipped. I think it's just a small sliver. But the problem is, is I'm going to have to talk to the buyer about this. I can't guarantee your next one is going to look this nice. So my ultimate suggestion would be just to live with that little small sliver because it's really not that bad. Then I noticed this was a, a little bit loose, but I mean, you can just tighten that up. That's no big deal. But I have not had a studio in a while, but I'm a big fan of them because they're basically just Les Paul standards without the top binding, the binding on the neck. Some years, they're a little bit slimmer than the Les Paul standards. And I believe that's definitely true for this one, but it's, it's not enough to really notice it unless somebody points it out to you. It's kind of like the SG horns. Until you see that they're asymmetrical, you never notice it. <laughs> But you get like that faux binding effect on this, but that's just the maple cap being exposed on the edge. So yeah, in person, definitely impressed with this guitar. Really all it's missing for me is a Mother of Pearl Gibson logo then. That would have been ultimately awesome. Oh, and one more thing before we move on to the next one. These new gig bag soft shell cases, whatever they're calling them, I didn't notice this new feature. Do you guys see that? It's a neck locker with your Velcro strap right here. In the first generation, go back to my old boxing video with one of those things. That was the one thing I hated about those cases because it used to have two straps and you had to fight them to get it off. It would fall back on if you like just trying to take your guitar out. It would lock it back into place. This one, you can just rip it out like that. You don't have to worry about this flap. So it's actually a really nice update. So good job on that, Gibson. No sponsors today, but if you're interested in sponsoring the show, if you have a guitar company or something, you're welcome to. Just reach out to me via email or on my website. 
So this one, I believe is my accessory. I figured we'd get this one out of the way. Sometimes when I see things on reverb that are just a good price, I pick them up. And this one I thought was a good price because what sleeps in here is just a Gibson SG case. And I can't tell you how many times I've had like a really nice SG that didn't originally ship with the case like from the late 90s, or early 2000s. And I've needed one and you just can't find them. I think I picked this up for like what, a hundred bucks? Something cheap like that. And hey, it even has original silica packet in here. So generally with cases, I mean, it, it's not really worth buying them to resell. You might make what, 20, 25 bucks. It's more so worth it to me just to have it in case somebody wants to add a case to a guitar that doesn't have one. So if I'm ever selling a guitar that has a gig bag, you can ask me about a case. Sometimes I'll have it, sometimes I won't. Other times, I mean, we could wait for a new one to come in or something. I'm flexible on stuff like that, but yeah, this is one of the nice ones. It's, it's got the uh, combo lock there. 90 style handle, and it should be a Canadian made one. So do you buy the Chinese made one that's currently offered today? Or do you buy the older Canadian one for half off? I think it's a no brainer in my opinion. But it's not really fair to compare new to used. So next up, let's do this one, the clickbait title of this. So I don't normally out people with their full names when I buy stuff from them, but this one, it made me smile. His name is legitimately Timothy Turner. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought this from a cartoon character, Timmy Turner from the Fairly Odd Parents. He's grown up now, he likes guitars, but he had to sell this one. <laughs> Man, I bet that guy just, just hates that by now. I'm sure that's not the first time he's heard it. Or maybe he's a fan of that cartoon show. I know that was one of my more favorite Nicktoons back in the day. But anyways, this was kind of an interesting story. So I had... I believe it was that SG Custom from the 60th anniversary run for sale. And Mr. Turner here had this in his reverb shop. And I had made an offer on it. And then he had messaged me. He's like, hey, coincidentally, I want to buy something that you have. So he's going to think about my offer. And at that point, I told him, hey, man, just literally raise your price because you can get more for this guitar. And then you could afford to buy my guitar. Because generally, I try to give people good advice because he had this very fair, I told him to raise his price to 3200 bucks. be patient, it will sell. I'm not sure what happened between point A and point B. The listing ended up getting taken down and then like two or three weeks later, I get a message from him saying, hey, do you still want to buy this guitar? It's like, sure. I mean, if, if you really want to sell it and not take my advice, it, it's fine. Sometimes an easy, quick sale with a guy that you know on the internet versus somebody else buying it on the internet that you haven't necessarily heard of. It works. And the story was good enough for me to break my rule of I'll never unbox another one of these again. Man, I love these Kirk Douglas signature SGs in the Inverness green color. They're just great. I love them. Now don't get me wrong, the black ones are cool too, but I really love this color. You just do not see it on SG Customs enough. And this guitar is just so ridiculously versatile, they super undersold these things at $2,500 brand new. So this one actually feels like it's a pretty chunky body. I'm curious if it will neck dive or not. Now generally, I mean, when you have one of these giant vibrolas on here, it doesn't, you know, affect it as much as non-vibrola units. Maybe that's why Gibson's putting these things on everything, but then you have to worry about tuning stability. But it was kind of funny. The day I bought this guitar, I had somebody reaching out to me. I've exported so many of these things to Canada, and it was another Canadian guy going, hey, can you help me get one of these Inverness green ones? It's like, yes, potentially. <laughs> I mean, I've got this one coming in. Uh, he was uh, concerned about condition. Uh, I mean, the guy told me there's like a, a small ding somewhere. Yeah, right there. That looks like it came from the factory like that. It's either that or it was like a strap. That is a very small impression. Like you have to be looking for that and know that it is there to find that. Other than that, this thing is, you know, pretty much brand new condition. I think he said he purchased it brand new. But it's starting to get to that point where it's like, oh man, maybe, maybe I should keep one of these. Okay, there we go. There are a few scratches on the headstock. They're not super deep. 
uh, I don't know if a polished job would get those out though. So we've got a couple of small impressions right there, but other than that, pretty clean. So if you want to learn more about the Captain Kirk Douglas SG, you can check out my full review and demo. I really see these things becoming highly collectible and expensive, you know, within the next 10 years or so. I mean, people are asking up to $1,000 plus the original 2500 and I've been pretty successful selling them between that $3,000 to $3,200 range. That's why I told them, yeah, you can definitely get that. I've sold enough of these to know. I mean, they're out of production. They way underproduce these as a limited edition because they just, they put too many cool specs in these things. But one of these days, I need to review an original Captain Kirk Douglas, which all of a sudden doesn't look anywhere near as good as these newer ones. Unlike the Jag Stang, it seems like a lot of you guys like that Jag Stang review and demo. A lot of guys were talking down on the old Made in Japan runs, saying that the, uh, the pickups don't quite sound as good. But who knows, maybe I'll have to try one of those things out one day. Sometimes the reissue is better than what it is emulating. Not always. You can take like R9s for instance. Is it better than a burst? <sighs> Very subjective. It just depends on a lot of factors. Was it a good burst? What are they doing? But I think we can all agree six and a half thousand dollars is a heck of a lot cheaper than three hundred thousand dollars. There's actually a, a couple of really nice bursts for sale. I might have to do a, just a guitar hunting episode of bursts. But inside here, this is a guitar from my good collector friend, Donnie. We've had complete episodes dedicated to me buying out this guy's collection, but this time it's just one. He said this was one of his favorite players. So I'll be interested to check this out. And after all that work, let's go ahead and see what he sent me in this beautiful Generation 2 chainsaw case. Just in case you're not familiar, Gen 1 only has these front two latches. There's a few other small differences. Check out my chainsaw case video if you need a refresher. All right. Here's another Black Les Paul Custom from my friend who collects Black Les Paul Customs. Imagine that. I'm actually having a, a lot of fun having a bunch of customs in stock again. Like I have that wine red one, I've got this black one now, I had that silver burst from my other collector buddy. Then we also had that same tobacco burst one. So when I started my guitar resale business, customs are what I would buy because customs, they're a very good store of value. They're easy to sell. Standards are a little bit tougher to sell, at least the Norlin era ones. Not by a whole lot, it's just, there's a lot of buyers for customs. So I always have a, a soft spot for these things, especially like really rare colors and things like that. So this, I really like this one because the serial number has a lot of zeros in it. It's 81000525. So it's a 1980 hundredth day of the year. Hey, that might be your birthday. But this thing's a, a bit dirty and dusty. So that means we are going to have a little bench segment on this one, clean it up take a quick look at its parts, but something else you're gonna notice just straight out of the box. Factory chrome hardware. Gets a little bit more common in the 80s, a little bit more rare in the late 70s. And this is the 100th day of 1980, so it kind of falls somewhere in between there, but this will be the make bull neck era. Looks like our neck's okay. And I had him uh, already take a picture of the truss rod, but we'll take a look at that later. Uh-oh. Do we have finish damage? I'll have to ask him about that. He might have just missed that. There's actually a crack coming from our tailpiece, which is rather unfortunate. We'll have to take a look at that on the workbench. But also on top of this, I purchased some parts from him. We'll see the rest of the haul unboxed in a future episode. But this time I had purchased I might have actually even sold them these at one point in time. They're the Gibson branded Schaller tuners in chrome. So if you're looking for a set of these, I'll sell it for 150. You can just email me about these. Honestly, I, <laughs> I rarely ever have time to list small parts. I just accumulate a big pile of them. Two hours later, here we are. It's looking like a mirror again, but let's go ahead and document the condition of this thing. So it's got scratches, nicks, and dings. It's a very prominent three-piece top. You can see the seam line, you know, running up here 
and then running up here. Now, sometimes you can get some top separation going on. That's not what this is. This is simply the lacquer has sunk into the seam line because it's like just barely opened up. This is not something you're gonna have to worry about. But it is good to know about because I mean, if you hate the way it looks, it, it, it's never gonna go away. I mean, you could refinish the entire top, but it's not gonna be worth it. Then of course, we've got some slightly heavier picking scratches right here, and that's after a polish job. I don't buff these things or use cutting polishes or anything. I just use the Virtuoso brand cleaner and polish, and I think it looks great. There's other stuff you can use that might get rid of some of this other stuff, but I, I'm too worried to ever use a cutting polish. Maybe one day I'll try it on a guitar that's not so expensive. But unfortunately, if you catch it in the light just right, you can see like this weird stain on the top. My best guess as to what this is, is a deodorant has reacted to the finish because when you're playing, that's kind of where your arm, armpit might be. It could also be something like bug spray. Some suntan lotions can even eat away at your finish. So that's what I'm guessing that is. Again, a cutting polish might get rid of that, but you have to be looking for that. You've got to get it in the light to see it. So as far as when you're just regularly playing this thing, you're not really going to notice it, but it is there. Just like we've got this ding in the top right there. You've got a kind of a series of them right here. There's a scratch in this area that's a little bit deeper, but that's pretty much gonna be covered by your tailpiece. And there's like a, a weird raised area in the finish right there. I'm not sure what that's about. And then of course, we've got this crack we need to talk about. So when I was polishing this up, I put some painter's tape over top of it because when you have a split in the top like that, you, you don't really want the polish and stuff to get in there. That could cause it to uh, separate even more. Now it's cracked all the way to here and then it's cracked all the way through here. Now this pickup's kind of hard to get out, but here you can see what I'm saying. It just cracked all the way through. So the good news is there's literally nowhere left for this to go. It stopped there and it stopped there because that's where the wood stops. That could have been worse. It could have cracked like sideways and went zoop. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not even sure how that happened. I would guess Maybe at one point in time, it took a blow right there. But as far as over here, not too many nicks and dings, a few. Knobs have a nice age to them. And underneath our pick guard, of course, you have that regular ding from the back side of that bracket. There's a couple of dings right here, and some scratches, all that other good stuff. So it looks nice now that I've cleaned it up, but definitely player's grade. But as far as our pickups here, they are original. They are T-tops yet. Kind of not quite to Tim Shaw's and Customs yet in early 1980. That one dates to February 13th, 1980. So a Valentine's Eve guitar pickup. And then this one, it looks like it says March 4th, 1980. It's got a really short lead on it. I thought for sure when I looked into the back control plate cavity, that pickup would have been taken out at one point in time, put back in. But the soldering looks very convincing to me. But we've got a short neck tenon, nothing crazy going on here. And nothing too crazy in this one either. We can see the maple top right there. The pickup covers themselves have string wear on them. So that means somebody had this bridge pickup hoisted all the way up and the action decked all the way down. You can kind of see some of that on the neck pickup too. Bridge pickup reads 7.46k ohms and our neck position 7.59 with a middle position for fun at 376. Now it's kind of unique about the bridge studs. Is this is the one that they used on the top adjust to pneumatic, like as far as the bottom goes. So it's possible these might've actually been replaced. But the bridge itself is a Schaller made in Germany. So that is correct for this time period. And you know, that's probably why this cracks. Somebody swapped those out. This bridge, it's not like super collapsed, but it's not the proper radius anymore as most of these things are. It doesn't actually sit flush. So when the strings push down all that pressure, it kind of bends the bridge and maybe that's causing some additional stress here and that's that's probably what did it. The tailpiece looks correct to me. But moving on from our three-piece maple top and mahogany body, we've got the three-piece maple neck. So we've got 22 low wide frets on these. The ebony board, it's in good shape. You can definitely see like the regular player's pattern of wear and that's after cleaning it with a bit of steel wool and conditioning it. And you've got a little bit of fingernail divoting in a few areas. Now, as much play as this thing has saw, I'd say the frets are in respectable condition. I mean, you can see the very light divots starting to form, but you can just barely even feel those. So I think you're going to be okay on this. That's definitely the worst one right there. G string looks like fourth fret. Everything else. 
Yeah, it doesn't feel too bad. What the heck were they doing right here on the fourth fret? <laughs> That's not where I play that much. But all our fret nibs are intact and everything. This is all clean, ready to go and polished. With a 1.68 inch nut width, that increases to 2.05 by the 12th. First fret neck depth of 0.87, then 0.98 by the 12th. That's a bit misleading. We'll take it at the 11th, 0.95 because you get the heel starting right there, so definitely more accurate to take it there. Slim 60s neck. Slim taper, that's what these customs are known for. Face of the headstock, thankfully, everything up here is looking all right. Truss rod's in perfect shape. Got the Les Paul custom truss rod cover on there, and uh, you've got some scratches, some nicks and dings. Nothing too crazily over at the top, but I'd say that's a fine looking headstock. I thought this was interesting on the tuners. I have never seen wear and tear like that. Somebody dinged the tuner, not once, but twice. <laughs> the other ones look okay. I've never seen damage to any of the tops of tuners before. That's a new one on me. Now we'll move along to the backside. Decently clean until you, you know, get it in the light. That's when you're gonna start to see some of this other stuff. So you've got some buckle scratches and worming right here. But once again, I polish this up, it's a mirror. Hello. <laughs> but besides that area, let's see. You can definitely see like the lacquer sink into the mahogany body in a lot of locations, but there's some dings, there's some scratches down here. Bunch of just stuff scattered. It's, yeah, there's a big patch of worming right there. But again, it kind of disappears until you get it into the light. So, player's grade. Don't buy this thinking it's a collectible. But inside our control cavity, it's interesting. This is the first time I've seen this. So we've got Randy's dad's signature in here, Floyd Leonard. I've seen the pluses and I've seen stars, but I've never seen a plus minus. <laughs> Generally, that means it sounded really good or it had an awesome top. This is a black custom, so I'm not sure what he meant by that. But you can see like a small area where the lacquer has been like polished through to the mahogany. But everything looks untouched in here to me. I mean, that's a big old solder blob. And the pots are dating to 1979, 30th week. Well, looking at this one, it actually looks like 39th week. So something around there. But it's always a nice treat to get one of the Leonard family signatures in these guitars. We've got the shielding tray over here, and you can see inside your toggle switch cavity right there. But we do have Schaller strap locks on this one. I do not have the original buttons. Lots of times he will save those, but this one must have came without that. Small ding on the side. A couple of more dings. I mean, it was used. Got the thick binding in the cutaway, as is common for customs of this era. Couple more dings. Looking good. Now onto the neck. It's generally really common to see those seam lines show up on the neck and less so on the front. But this one, the neck is just fine. You don't have any of those lines, it's the top. But there is a small area of finish wear right here. You can tell somebody was definitely soloing up here quite a bit. It's a little bit more of a, a matted feel right here. So it's definitely a little bit slicker and glossier right here. And then you got that small area that kind of stops. I wonder if that's because this guy would always slide up and have us wait a minute that'd be where this hand is so judging by where that is this guy must have did a lot of sliding up here and then it just kind of naturally stops at this 12th fret so he must have been soloing up here a lot because it would be this part of his hand that rubs against that area so he's just doing that thing or at least that would be my best guess but besides that you do have a, a very small impression right there and seems to be in all right shape otherwise. Backside of the headstock, I didn't see any major gouges, just a few scratches, maybe some impression lines up here from a tuner, kind of by your serial number, you see what I'm talking about there? But there's that cool serial, 81000. It's like 545, or 525 rather. And made in USA, it's a Nashville production model. Got a little bit of finish rub through on each of the wings. Something else that's kind of cool about this one, Outside of that seam line you're seeing right there, you can actually see a wood grain like straight up and down vertical. It kind of looks cool. It looks like additional finish checking, but that's just the wood grain showing through. So I bet this piece of maple would actually be quite gorgeous if you could see underneath that black paint. And as far as the weight, it's average for the era. 10 pounds, 4 ounces. 
Now let's switch over to the blacklight test. Yeah, this thing's a old guitar. It's gonna blacklight pretty well for us. You can once again see that sweat absorption area. So, I mean, that kind of makes sense that it would be some sort of a deodorant stain or whatnot. You can see those nicks and dings a little bit more clearly like this too. Looks like a couple more right there. Take a look at that crack right there. Then you can see the seam line separation. You, you see the difference there? This is actually a really good example. The difference between a crack and a seam line or a finish check. See how that's nice and dark? The finish has never been broken. The finish has been broken on that one. There's those cool knobs again. Awesome, let's flip it over to the back. Okay, so it looks like definitely might have been a sticker on here at one point in time or they just kind of rubbed the finish a bit. You can definitely see some sort of a stand rash mark right there. As far as the rest, not too bad. Go around the edges of the neck. A couple of dings. Things are looking okay here. Ooh, definitely some dings right there. That's why I like the blacklight test. It, it shows you things that I can't necessarily tell you about. Like on this guy, you could only see an area of wear right here, but you can see where he's just playing all up and down here. Now the biggest field difference is right there where the bare wood is exposed. But then you can just see pretty much all up and down the neck there is a little bit of a clear coat wear. Curious, is it like that on the other side? Just a little bit, not as much. Then you definitely have some in this area. But thankfully, I mean, there truly is no difference in feel in this neck anywhere from what I feel after I've polished it, except for this area. Feels a little slower. But no breaks, cracks, or repairs on this guy. Same story for the face of the headstock. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.